breathing. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Maloney. I'm the Vice Dean of the Paris School of International Affairs, and uh, welcome to this, the eighth Youth and Leaders Summit uh, hosted here at, uh, at Sciences Po. Um, that was a very nice opening by, uh, by Guillermo Laola uh, Palais, who's an MSc um, environmental policy student here at PSIA. And uh, you'll find uh, over the course of the day, there'll be uh, a few more um, interventions by, by her, uh, musical interludes, uh, uh, part of the theme of, of this year's summit. Um, and there's a second student artist as well, but I'll, uh, I'll let our dean uh, introduce uh, her as, as well as part of the, the introduction. Um, so we're going to start in just one minute. We're just going to get the, the final things off the stage, and then I'm going to invite to the stage uh, right now, in fact, um, the director of Sciences Po, Mathis Vichera, and the dean of PSIA, Arantxa Gonzalez. Please. After such a fantastic moment of music, this is very difficult for me. <laughs> This is really difficult. Don't worry, it won't be long. Dear Arancha Gonzalez, Dean of PSIA, dear Mac Maloney, Vice Dean of PSIA, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, my dear friends, welcome to Sciences Po. First of all, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation to the eighth annual Youth and Leader Summit, a unique international conference that gives students a central role in its organization and in the debate. And I would like to congratulate and to thank especially the 30 students from PSIA who helped to organize and deliver this event. This summit is really special for two main reasons. The first one, for the standing and diversity of the leaders, of the speakers, and the second reason has to do with the fact that there is a real, a true dialogue between these leaders and the students. And in a way, this summit is a place where youth can engage and challenge the leaders. Please, dear students, we want you to raise your voice today. Don't be impolite, don't be impolite, but you need to be challenging. You need to be challenging because our leaders need to be challenged by you. I'm also convinced that these exchanges have a great deal to offer to the leaders we invite. These leaders will meet new visions of society, new ways of thinking, and new ambitions. And I would like also to congratulate and to thank the New York Times for the tremendous partnership that we have with them. This edition of the Youth and Leader Summit is really special. We don't have one topic. The previous editions, we, have, we had one topic. This year, we have a series of burning issues that present existential risks to the global order. Existential risk to the global order. 
It is clear for us that there are many issues that are interconnected. You know that, climate change, digital transition, populism, growing economic inequality. Don't worry, don't worry, my friends. I won't try to address all these issues my, myself in a few minutes. But as you know, the world is at crossroads and Sciences Po has a specific role to play. We do believe that we are not a university like any other. We have a specific role in that situation. Due to the fact that we were funded 150 years ago in a specific condition, you know that, after the war, and we have also a specific responsibility because we train free-thinking leaders, new leaders, capable of making informed decisions. We deeply believe at Sciences Po that teaching and research can change the world. This is maybe a little bit immodest, but we do believe that. And this is precisely what you are going to do today. You will try to understand the world. You will think out of the box and you will identify new tools and new solutions. Before concluding this speech, I wanted just to tell you that we do have a specific issue that we share with Pia, with Arancha, with Marc, with all the communities of Sciences Po. It has to do with academic freedom. Academic freedom. You know, this is not just a corporate topic. This is not just a corporate issue for researchers, for universities. This is one of the foundations of democracy. This is a necessary condition of democracy. And in this current period of time, we do have one of all members, one of the members of all communities, Fariba Adelha, who, is, who has been jailed for three years only because of, our, of her research. And we do believe that academic freedom is really, really, really something to protect, really something to promote. And this is the reason why you know that even in the European Union, there are some issues about academic freedom. For instance, the Central European University was displaced from Budapest to Vienna. And this is the reason why at Sciences Po, with uh, all the communities, we want to nominate them, CEU Fariba, this year to the Peace Nobel Prize. We do believe that this is our role to promote, to protect academic freedom, thanks to this uh, proposal. I hope, I hope that you will join us in this mobilization for them. Again, my friends, all my gratitude to the speakers, to the fantastic speakers for taking part in this summit, for sharing their thinking with us, and most importantly, for their willingness to be challenged by our students. A big applause to the PSIA team, please. And for the students involved in this organization, now let me now hand over to the fantastic Dean of PSIA, Arancha Gonzalez. Thank you, my friends. Many thanks, Matthias. Uh, thank you very much for the framing that uh, you've done for this conference. Many thanks also to Guillermina for the music and to Anna, Ver Anna Verena, uh, the artist that is going to be illustrating the debates today because art is also part of our DNA. We can express it with music, we can express it with uh, designs, with cartoons. Um, it's a sobering start of the year. And it's sobering because we're going to start with the risks that threaten all of us. Risks to our common prosperity. Risks to our freedom and rights. Risks to life in uh, our ocean. Risks to our planet and the existential risk of a nuclear threat. And it's sobering because these are human-made risks. We have created those risks. And therefore, we have the power to manage or to harness them. It's in our hands. There is no fatalism about these risks. And this is why today's discussion is about how 
can we manage those risks? It's not about being sad about the risks, which we are, but it's what we can do to harness them. And this is why leadership matters. And this is why this edition is about youth and leaders. This is obviously your edition. You've chosen the topics. Uh, you are on the driving seat, which is why, again, this is about youth and leaders. Resolving the dilemmas around the risks is going to necessitate a few ingredients. So let me throw a few ingredients so that we can use them in the conversations during the day. First, managing those risks requires rigorous research, rigorous analytics, rigorous thinking. No magical thinking will address those risks. Second, it requires dialogue, it requires discussion, it requires to express the disagreements, but also to find common points of convergence, agreements. Disagreeing has not been an enemy. It's just simply expressing a different position. So let's try to express different positions if we have them. The third ingredient I want to throw um, for the conversation is empathy. Empathy, which means basically putting ourselves in the shoes of the other. This, for example, would be essential in the discussion we will have on the energy transition, which needs to be fair. And for that, we need a bit of empathy. Finally, I would suggest we need a bit of respect if we are to create the trust that is necessary to manage those risks. These are some of the ingredients that uh, I think we need to consider when addressing uh, those challenges. Now, this is about youth and leaders, but it's therefore an intergenerational dialogue. Because there is no fatalism, there is a bit of responsibility on the younger generation also to lead, to find fair, equitable solutions, effective means to address today's challenges. And this is why we will end today with Chai Surui. She is, this is by the way, one of the choices for uh, speaking at this Youth and Leaders Summit. She is a 25-year-old Brazilian from an indigenous uh, group, the Paiter Surui in the Amazon, who's decided to be an activist, to find solutions to protect the Amazon and through that fight against climate change. She's convinced that she, that you, can influence today, since at the end of the day, the future is yours. So, engage, discuss, debate with respect, but also without being afraid of expressing disagreement or dissent. I hope you learn a lot from our guests. I am sure the guests will learn a lot uh, from all of you. Let me end uh, with a word of gratitude to our media partner, the New York Times. We are extremely proud uh, to work with you every year um, to deliver this event. Stephen, uh, Liz, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. You're gonna have fun, you know that, because you've been here before, this year even more. Um, and with this, let the, the forum begin, and let's start the first conversation. Uh, let me call on stage Jose Manuel Salazar. He is the Executive Secretary of the UN Ecom Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. She's come all the way from Chile uh, to be with us this morning. Let me call uh, also Katarina Korner from the International Economic Policy Master. Julie Byrne, um, International Economic Policy Master, who are going to be part of this conversation, and last but not least, Liz Alderman, uh, who is a, a great uh, journalist from the New York Times, specialized in 
Economic and Trade, who's going to moderate this conversation. Without further ado, give them a big applause.